short tea break. So we are going to commence our next session, which is session seven, which is an innovation and technology and tourism pro environmental behavior. To make this session more insightful, we have three speakers from three different countries. We would like to, on behalf of CRATE and all the organizing committee, we would like to uh, thank and invite all the speakers to this session. So without further ado, let me introduce the moderator of the session. Before that, very, once again, a quick guidelines, session guidelines for all the participants, for the new and already attending participants. I think we are all be on time. I think uh, no issues on that. Be prepared. Please ensure that all your laptops, tablets, whatever device you are using is fully charged or at least connected to the electricity so that you will have a smooth experience. And always be presentable with a very good photo during the digital photo session. Uh, in the chat, we always share the Zoom virtual background, which you can use to make yourself more presentable during the digital photo session and be a good listener which can help you to put a constructive or maybe a meaningful questions to the speakers. Use the chat more responsibly for any queries to the organizers or maybe, and be respectful and communicate and more importantly, minimize the distractions. So all the Q&A sessions of this Crit Summer School will be using the Slido. So please scan this QR code if you are start planning to put questions for the speakers. We will also share the direct link in the chat in a short while. So let me introduce the moderator for this wonderful session seven, innovation and technology and tourist pro environmental behavior. We have none other than one of our colleague and friend from Taylor's University, Dr. Tanam Subramaniam. So without further ado, I will pass the floor to Dr. Tanam. Thank you, Dr. Kandapan. Okay. Very good evening, dear panel speakers and audience. Welcome to our second Creed Summer School program. I am Dr. Tanam Subramaniam, the moderator of today's session. It is a great pleasure to have all you back continuously from morning to this wonderful sharing session focusing on innovation and technology and tourist pro environmental behavior. Apparently, technology in tourism as a profound impact on the industry movement. It's rapidly changed the behavior of both suppliers and consumers in the market. Technological development in tourism added more advancement in the value change. Evidently, the travel itinerary planning is currently involved with technological innovation, including online booking engines, real-time transaction management, and all in one market platform. In addition, this innovation and technologies plays important role in the post pandemic, where the touchless service delivery and investment in digital technology could be the bridge of recovery. In line of recovering the tourism and hospitality industry while aiming to the sustainable tourism, we can't ignore the essential role of pro environmental behavior among the tourists to protect and conserve the nature and environment. The development of the sustainable tourism is important as an environmentally sustainable future. Tourists being the main consumer in the tourism industry can largely enhance the environmental protection if they choose to travel sustainability. Without further delay, let me introduce our first panel speaker Professor Dr. Xavier Fon. Dr. Xavier Fon is a professor of sustainability marketing at the University of Surrey, UK, and editor in chief of the Journal of Sustainable Tourism. He researched and developed methods of sustainable tourism pro production and consumption. He has published widely about the sustainable tourism certification and has consult on the sustainable product development marketing and communication. Currently, he serves as an advisor in Prince Harry's Travelist Coalition of Booking.com, TripAdvisor, Trip.com, Visa, Google, and Expedia. 
He was a part of the team in conducting stakeholders consultation for the European transition pathway constructed by the European Commission. He is currently the principal investigator for the University of Surrey for the 23 million in the project experience to develop the low season sustainable tourism visitors experience in UK and France. Now, I would like to welcome Professor Dr. Xavier Fron to deliver his lecture. Prof, the floor is yours. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I don't know whether it's morning or um, evening at, at your end, but um, I'm glad you've made it. You know, we've got more than 200 people here participating today. Um, as you know, when we talk about technology and how it can help us to improve um, our ability of the tourism industry to contribute to sustainable development goals, there are very many different things that we could cover. Okay, so I'm going to look at one particular case study today because I think that uh, you know, it's, it's such a broad topic that's impossible to be able to cover every single aspect. So let me share my screen with you and I will then uh, take you from, from here. Okay, so what we've got basically is many possibilities. And uh, today I want to talk to you about something that uh, Dr. Tana mentioned about my current work in her introduction. And that is, um, for me, something that's really exciting that's happening right now. Um, it was a coalition that was initiated by Prince Harry. Uh, you probably know Harry and Meghan and the whole story. They're not in the UK anymore. You follow that press. Great. But one of the really good things that's happened as a result of his collaboration, his interest for nature conservation, is that he brought together, um, essentially, he used his, you know, his own uh, experience and, and uh, you know, connections to bring together a number of partners. And that includes Booking.com, Skyscanner, Trip, uh, TripAdvisor, Visa, and more recently, they've been joined by Google and Expedia. And why am I talking about this today? Because essentially, a coalition of this style with the knowledge that they have about technology and the ability that these particular groups of companies, the size of these companies and the power that they have, is absolutely fantastic as a way of creating change within a sector. So if you think about it right now, if you wanted to create change in a sector, particularly using technology in our case, if you try to change tour operators, you'd have 20,000 companies to change. If you try to change hotels, you'd have several million companies. If you try to change consumers, you have 900 million. However, the, the six, seven companies I'm mentioning here have a disproportionate power and therefore a disproportionate responsibility towards using their tools to actually create positive change. And what they've done um, under the, um, you know, let's say advice, but also pressure, to be honest, from Prince Harry and the coalition that he's brought together, is to be able to say, well, how do we use our online platforms to help consumers make greener choices? Now, clearly, um, in my role as being a part of the advisor group, I've signed a non-disclosure agreement. So what I'm sharing today with you are things that, as um, you know, to my knowledge, are already available in the public domain. Okay, I cannot tell you any of the things that are kind of behind the scenes, and certainly not when you're recording and live streaming. Um, uh, you know, what I'm trying to say in here is, look, there are a number of things that are happening with these groups. The first thing is, through this coalition, these very large technology companies have always been geared primarily and solely to increasing volume of sales and increasing profitability and increasing market share. And now basically saying part of our work is doing this in a more responsible way and understanding what our own responsibilities as a company. And one of those elements is, for example, Booking.com every year now has a really interesting sustainability report. If you haven't looked at this, it's worth looking at it because it makes some of the research that we do as an academics look really, really small. These guys survey more than 30,000 consumers on a year by year basis. And, and what I like about this is not only that they're telling us what those consumers are saying, but as a company, they are absorbing this knowledge. They're basically saying, we need to change. And so surveys like this or what Expedia, another one of the members is doing, and the fact that they are coming up with this kind of knowledge, you could say on the one hand, these large companies, when they do this, this is PR, this is media, this is about being seen, but there could be an element of greenwashing. Now, my argument here is getting a large company to transition 
from where they are to where we want them to be has a period of growing pains. It's a little bit like becoming a teenager. You're not a child and you're not an adult yet. You have some characteristics of both. And for a little while, your arms are too long and your legs are too long and something doesn't quite look right and you have spots in your face. Well, this is where we're at really in these large companies that are making these internal transformations and they're trying to figure out what the transformation looks like. But I think ultimately this kind of knowledge really helps. What Booking.com has done now is they have more than 100,000 properties that provided enough information about the sustainability practices to be able to highlight it on their pages. So you can see here on the top right hand side that, for example, if you search for hotels in Amsterdam, this is one of the, the ones that just came up. And in the, you know, just below the name of the hotel and the stars, it says travel sustainable property. And if you click on this property to look at it, we now know that when you have a label like this, more people click on your property because technology allows us to have this kind of real time knowledge. And we also know where and how you need to display those labels to maximize the number of people that click on it. Right. So when you click on it, one of the things you'll find is in this particular for this particular hotel, these are the list of travel sustainable measures that this company has self reported that they are doing. And I know you may say to me, self-reporting is wrong because companies can say whatever they want. We now have legislation in Europe that a company like Booking.com could be sued for providing sustainable information that has not been third party externally verified. So we're now going through the process of saying, how do we have an external quality assurance of this information? If you think about it, certification as we know it so far has given us a maximum of 10, 15,000 properties that were sustainably certified in 25 years that worked in this sector. Booking.com has achieved more than 800,000 properties providing information on sustainability, of which they've selected the best 100,000 to display on the website. They've achieved in one year what the mainstream NGO sector of sustainable tourism has not achieved in 25. He is, to me, one of the places where technology has a power, because these hotels are basically saying, when it's an NGO asking me for this, who cares? When it is the online distribution center that provides revenue for me, and they're saying to me, this information, we will use it to actually increase your sales. Or alternatively, if you don't provide this information, you will be lowering the search engine for that particular destination, and that's going to affect your sales this creates actual change. Now, I still have, you know, like, like I was saying, remember, the, we are in the spotty teenage years, okay? It's not perfect. We have a lot of improvements to make in here. So if you look at the list of travel sustainable measures, it's still assume, it's focusing on things that consumers will be able to see when we get there. So a consumer can spot whether the hotel has recycling bins available, whether property is reducing food wastage in some ways, or whether there's a water cooler where you have to always buy water. So it follows the, the, the approach that companies are, of this kind of technology normally follow, which is customers no longer care how many stars a hotel has. Customers care about what is previous customer rating on this topic. Right, so it follows the mentality if customers can spot the things you're talking about, they will be, be able to then um, assess your property based on those activities. Having said that, and I'll talk about this in a second, we need to make sure that we collaborate with companies like this to make this information much more useful for customers to take informed decisions. We're still assuming, look at the list of things that we've got in here, we're still assuming that consumers choose a sustainable hotel for altruistic reasons. And still nowadays, many consumers believe a sustainable hotel will have a compromise in quality, in convenience, in price, in location, compared to a hotel that is not sustainable. So we have some work to do. Google Flights has done something similar. They're part of the same Travelist Coalition. And since they joined Travelist, one of the things they've done, when you now do a particular search, this is from New York to Barcelona. And it tells you the typical information, the times, the duration of the flight, the number of stops, the price. But look at also what it tells you in the middle now. And this is brand new. The CO2 emissions of your flight. And because most of us, we don't know 
whether that's high or low, then it tells you for that particular route, is this above or below the average CO2 emissions? So now what you're finding is, look, if I'm a business traveler and I have no choice but to fly from A to B, I could fly with Lufthansa at 603 pounds, but my emissions are 33% higher than average. Or I could pay a bit more in this case, but have 12% below average emissions. Now, the good thing here is you now have carbon emissions together with price in the same page. Okay. Now, in this particular route, it happens to be that Lufthansa had higher emissions but a lower price. But very often, this is not the case. One of the things we're now looking at is how does providing information like this help consumers make different choices? Both what you've seen now from Booking and from Google are based on the principle that there isn't a niche market that wants to deliberately book sustainable holidays. And we will create niche tour operators or niche hotels or niche ecologists for that. It's based on the principle that if we change 1% of the world to behave in a more sustainable way by using behavioral science techniques, we will achieve a greater collective impact than by changing 100% the behavior of 1% of the world. Right? Changing 100% of consumers by 1% is so much more powerful. Okay? And, and like this, Skyscanner has done exactly the same thing. They're part of the same coalition. Now, if you think about these technology companies, one thing they're really, really good at is doing A-B testing of their online platforms. The tests that we as academics or NGOs take forever to do, we probably never even do, these guys do day in, day out. When I was advising Booking on how to create this, we did more than 30 different tests on their platforms at the same time with different market segments because they've got sufficient volume of consumers going to the Booking platform every day. So we could test which ways of displaying what information was going to create the best custom impression. So I would pay some attention to some of the things you can see in here. And at the same time, I want to just give you some hints as to where I think the frontier is at right now. Okay, so I think that there are messages that require more authority. Okay, we know that whenever a message is provided to a consumer and we just say, here's what I do as a company or here's what I do. And it is verified by a third party or it's got, I don't know, the WWF Panda logo or any sort of logo that says, here is some backing, this additional authority always provides an additional level of credibility and reduces customer skepticism. And part of the challenge that I also have with many of the hotels that we're currently labeling as sustainable is the hotel rooms look like this, right? Now, when I showed this hotel room to the staff at Booking and I said, can you tell me which country this hotel is in? They said, no, I can't. Actually, guys, this hotel is from Malaysia. Okay, it doesn't scream Malaysia, does it? Okay, so the challenge that we've got in here is if a customer goes to a website and that hotel group is saying, I'm doing really good things for sustainability, but it doesn't show, the customer then is likely to have a certain disjointment, right? It's likely to say, this isn't working for me because my perception of what a sustainable hotel is, that's not much with the photo you're showing me. And as a result of this, I clicked on the property saying, I want to know more, but then the photos don't match. So we need to think, what is the kind of visuals that we expect? The customers would say, I will accept that as being quality, but also that response to the message of sustainability. And in some cases, we may have to actually play down the use of the S word because customers will otherwise have confusion. Right. So if this hotel says, we're very sustainable because we have high levels of insulation. We have very energy efficient heatings. We don't waste water. Most customers will say, am I going to have a better holiday? Or, you know, yes, you're going to use less water. Does this mean that my shower is going to be terrible? Yes, use less energy. Does this mean there's not going to be any air conditioning? What's in it for me? Can you see where I'm coming from? So the challenge that we've got is when large technology companies now go into the domain of displaying sustainable information for a large number of hotels, we then display information that cannot be personalized, that has to be standardized across all the hotel groups. And we need to identify what element of that standardization will resonate with those consumers. 
and indeed will resonate with consumers from different parts of the world. Because what, you know, for most consumers, when you say sustainable hotel, what they're thinking is any of these three photos on the right hand side. Right. And you look at those photos and look, I don't know about you, but I look at those photos and say, wow, I want to be there. Right. Whereas the previous photo just said, yeah, OK, whatever. It's clean. It's functional. It's a business hotel. It ticks the box. I should I should be able to sleep where they are, you know, in that place. Whereas these photos make me think this is Instagrammable. I can brag. Right? So we need to think about what does a customer expect from that sustainable hallway. Now, for me, even a company like Booking.com does not need every single one of the two plus million hotels to be highlighted as a sustainable hotel. Frankly, I wish that they all were. Okay, But the challenge that we've got is I need the five hotels that always come up highest in search engine you know, searches for each one of the destinations to be certified. Because most customers don't go past that initial list, right? And I need the hotels that have got the highest customer satisfaction to also be seen as the hotels that have uh, that kind of sense of I am sustainable. Because we, we, we need these large companies to be the ones that create an impression amongst consumers that sustainability and quality and customer satisfaction go together. Right. And so we may have to manipulate a little bit the system to be able to allow us to do this. The reason why I'm showing you this is because sustainable imagery is a real problem. We don't have enough good photos of what sustainable tourism looks like. If you go to Google and you search sustainable tourism, you will see photos that are really, really stupid. Right. Photos that don't really make you feel like I want to be there. We're going to see people hugging trees like really. 21st century, like this is 1980s, okay? We haven't really moved on in how we visualize sustainable tourism, okay? So we need much more nuanced objectives as well. You know, some of the work I'm now trying to do with these companies, when we're saying, how do we evaluate success of these campaigns? We're still evaluating success based on the number of hotels that now have this certification or this level of verification. My point is, well, do I want to measure success based on how many hotels are sustainable get sold? And do we have high level of sales on sustainable hotels? For any reason, do we sell more of those hotels, whether it's because customers identify they were sustainable or because they didn't? Or do I want to be able to have a link that says, are sustainable hotels, do they have a higher than average customer satisfaction? Do they have a higher than average um, uh, daily, average daily rate? Do they have a higher than average customer loyalty? Now, again, with a company the size of Booking, we can do this, and then we can have data that we can feed back to all the properties that can say, this is where we're at, right? A sustainable hotel essentially has these characteristics. Join that club, use becoming a sustainably certified hotel to achieve some of these benefits that you want. Because if you look at the list here on these objectives, how can sustainability increase any one of those things? Every hotel is chasing for recommendations, loyalty, higher expenditure, right? And what I now need to do is not only to convert the hotels that already believe in sustainability, the, the next change that we really have to do is convert the hotels that don't believe in sustainability, but they're going to do it for commercial reasons, okay? I'm also interested in how do we communicate sustainability? And I think this is where technology can really also help us because we can do all sorts of tests. And I am convinced that we have miscommunicated sustainability all along. What do I mean by this? We have found that we always just communicate, I'm a sustainable property, as if customers should care. Turn it around and think of the customer experience and think what information does the customer need to know before they book? And what is it about your sustainability practice that would help me? And once you've booked, well, as a consumer now, I need different information, how to prepare to come. Great. Is there something about sustainability practices that will help me pack better or look forward to my holiday better or book additional activities better and so on? So unpack the word, I am a sustainable hotel 
into a variety of things the hotel does that will help the customer at each one of these points in time to take more informed decisions. Now, I could continue, okay? We've got all sorts of content here and behavioral science is really growing at the moment. So we can look at how specific messages work much better than vague messages, how explicit messages will work differently to implicit messages, how the level of beneficiary would use has a very different benefit, you know, it will appeal to different kind of consumers and, you know, kind of messages. But ultimately, I'm not in a position really to do all this because I think it's time to move on to our second speaker and to uh, essentially allow some time for a conversation afterwards. So thank you very much for uh, listening to my introductory uh, presentation today, and I'm looking forward to the next speaker. Thank you, Prof, for the wonderful uh, sharing session. I definitely um, understand that uh, your, your model, your sharing, right? It's not only uh, providing some in, insight on the pro-environmental behavior, but actually trigger us to think back. It's actually help us to reflect back what we are really looking for whenever we are actually uh, looking for the hotels. And we can, it's amazed to see that uh, the business model that initiated by this uh, travelist uh, collusion to support this pro-environmental behavior. And I'm sure it's not only me, all the audience also will thinking to ask various questions from you. Dear audience, if you have more questions, don't worry. We will have a separate Q&A session with the prof. So please feel free to record all your questions in the Slido link that provided at the chat box. Okay, thank you, prof. Now, let me introduce our next panel speaker, Associate Professor Dr. Hannah Hardy. Associate Professor Dr. Hannah Hardy is a researcher with a keen interest in tourist behavior and sustainable tourism, and is based on, at the University of Tasmania in the Social of sorry, School of Social Sciences. Her research has been cited over 2,000 times, and she is the author of the three books, and the most recent of which is titled Tourist Tracking and Mobility. If any of you have come across or have read this book, then you it's a very, very great opportunity where you can see the author to, with us today. Some of the HANA's most well-known research is a multiple award-winning project, Tourism Tracker. The project was the first to track the tourists with, the, with their concern for the duration of their holiday throughout the entire destination. Tourism tracker's success result in the change in the way throughout, sorry, change in the way the destination such as the Tasmania collect the visitors information. So maybe it will be uh, totally different the way we are looking for the normal way to correcting the visitors information. Since its development, it has been used in many other national and international jurisdictions and has been since commercialized and has international and national reputation for innovative, engaged and impact-driven tourism research in the area of tourist behavior and sustainable tourism has led to have a variety of the national and international academy invites. She is one of the advisory board for the Global Tourism Plastic Initiative was a contributor to the Kasani call to the action on the sustainable tourism, tourism and has been a speaker and project partner for the UNWTO Sustainable Tourism Division One Planet. She is one of the editorial board of the varieties of the journals, including Tourism Geographies, Annals of the Tourism Research, Annals of the Tourism Research Empirical Insight, and Frontier in Sustainable Tourism. Anna is the co-founder, the higher successful ISO chat series. This series is dedicated to sharing the work of the tourism researchers across the globe during the COVID-19 pandemic on the regular basis. It's rapidly gained a reputation of being a collaborative, social and supportive space for the new emerged and experienced researchers from across the world. So without further ado, let me introduce or let me welcome 
Associate Professor Dr. Anna Hardy to deliver a lecture. Prof, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Thenem, and thanks very much to everyone for coming along today. I can see a couple of familiar faces in the room, including Rod. Um, so yeah, I do appreciate you joining um, me for this particular session. So in the session today, what I'm going to be talking about is how we can actually use technology to um, actually understand and also to encourage sustainable tourism behaviours. So I'm going to look at um, four different things. I'm going to look at how we can use technology to understand tourist experiences, how we can use technology to understand mobility, how we can use technology to change behaviour, and how we can use technologies to understand what citizens think of tourism in their regions. And all these things are really essential components in terms of things that we need to know to encourage sustainability. So let's move on to the next slide. I'm joining you here today, right down in the bottom of Australia, um, Tasmania. And I live um, just sort of up this mountain, I should point in the other direction, sort of my house is somewhere over here. And this mountain is called Mount Wellington Kunanyi. I'm joining you today from uh, Tasmania, which is also known as Lutruwida. And it's the, um, I'm joining you on the home of the Muanina people who are the traditional custom custodians of the land. Tasmania is a beautiful island, about 50% of it is national park or protected area. These are many of the photos of, of our beautiful state. And I guess it provides me with a lot of inspiration for the research that I do because sustainability is really, really important um, in this particular straight state with its very fragile environment, as it is in many, many parts of the world. So let's move through. Um, a lot of what I'm talking about today is from my book, Tracking Tourist Movement and Mobility, just a bit of a shameless plug for you. Um, so as I mentioned before, technology can give us a lot of information in our quest to um, promote, encourage and achieve sustainable tourism. So it can help understand things like mobility, the impacts of tourism, how the uh, uh, help us understand the visitor experience, behaviour change and also what communities think about the, our tourism that's happening at the moment and in the future. So let's look at a few of these particular issues. First of all, we can use technology to understand the visitor experience and particularly um, mobility. What I'm going to look at in this um, particular section is how we can actually understand mobility using technology such as social media. And as I speak, I believe that Facebook has been hacked at the moment. Um, hopefully none of your, web, your accounts have been hacked. So it's not without its problems. But what we can do is, provided we do this in an ethical way and within the terms and consent of all of these different platforms, we can actually use our technology and social media to understand where tourists are going. So many of you will know when you actually make a post, you might actually tag the location of your post, which is called a geotagging. And some platforms, such as Twitter, allow you to scrape the data. So vast, you know, millions and millions of um, users' uh, posts can be actually looked at and we can look and develop a sequence of the individual's geotags to understand where they're travelling. As we know, it's very difficult from social media to understand whether people are actually tourists or whether they're living in the location. And there's some really interesting papers that have been put out where different ways have been used um, and different algorithms to determine whether social media users are uh, actual tourists or whether they're more likely to be uh, residents. We can also look at the geotags in single locations to understand uh, crowding and also usage. So you can see where people are posting in specific cities and that gives you a sense of density and, and usage. It's not without its problems because we know that different types of people use different types of platforms. And we also know that many of the platforms have terms and conditions that don't allow us to scrape data. And that's something that I'm seeing at the moment coming through many of the reviews that I do for papers where people have used uh, scraping to actually automatically scrape data and it contravenes the terms and conditions of social media platforms. So we have to be really careful when we're using this type of technology. 
but if used ethically and within the boundaries of what their terms and conditions are, we can get some really interesting data. So this is a photo here of my little dogs up on the east coast of Tasmania and I geotagged them. So we can actually collect all these geotags and it can give us some really interesting insights. This is a study that was done a few years ago where the researchers actually collected um, many of the tags um, in different locations. In the first study by Basolis um, and, and colleagues in 2016, they, will be, they were able to understand uh, the spatial distribution of visitors' country of origin when they went to the Taj Mahal. So they looked at their geotags of the Taj Mahal and were then able to understand where these social media users were from and, uh, and so get a sense very quickly and easily of where people were coming from and who these visitors were to the Taj Mahal. And the paper by Chua et al um, in Italy, you can actually see how they've used the social media data and they've actually followed individuals moving down the coast of Italy. And it gave them a sense of um, where people were actually uh, moving, pardon me, not Italy. I think it was actually in Spain, if I'm looking correctly. But anyway, they could actually follow individuals and get a sense of the directionality and how people were moving through particular locations. So we can also use Wi-Fi and Bluetooth to do this as well, because as you know, when you're walking around with your mobile phone, um, if you've got your Bluetooth enabled or your Wi-Fi enabled, and it's not actually connected to a Wi-Fi signal or a Bluetooth signal, we can use scanners. We can actually pick up those particular signals, um, and then we can actually look at how individuals are moving around locations, because each of our phone has a unique identifying code, and it can give us a sense of how people are moving through particular locations. Bluetooth is much better for using fast moving art objects such as cars, whereas Wi-Fi is more suited to understanding pedestrians. So you can actually follow individuals as they move around shopping centres and things like that. Again, it has to be done ethically um, and it's not continual data because you just see that person as they pass by the particular scanners. So you don't necessarily, um, you can't necessarily see their movement between the two scanners. So that's how we can use um, that type of uh, technology. And there's been studies that have been done by Yoshimara um, and colleagues. Uh, they used Bluetooth scanning um, to track visitors in the Louvre using seven sensors. And they found that the path sequences of long and short stay visitors was actually quite the same. So whether you're going to the Louvre for a little period of time or a long period of time, you actually, tourists tended to go to see the 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 same things, they just went and saw them in a much faster fashion if they had less time. We can also understand how tourists move around locations using GPS technology that we have in our smartphones and also in our smart watches. There's been some fascinating research done by my, my good colleague, Bob McKercher and, um, and uh, his work mates in um, in both Hong Kong and also Noam Cheval Ahmet Birenboin from Israel. And they have actually done some very interesting work looking at how first and repeat visitors move through locations in Hong Kong. They asked people to actually carry GPS trackers and they, will be able, they were able to understand how people moved around Hong Kong for in one particular day, because the GPS units only have a battery life that's fairly short. And they could, they, from this study, they were able to determine that first time visitors tend to sample the big, the big iconic places when they go to a place for the first time, whereas repeat visitors tend to sort of concentrate their activities um, it, and, and visit far fewer places. And their, their behaviour was more sporadic and they had many more trips away from their hotel than first time visitors. So that's a really quick look at how we can use technology to understand mobility using Wi-Fi, Bluetooth and GPS technology plus social media. We can also use it um, through bespoke apps. So some research that we did, um, we started it back in 2016, used Tourism Tracer. And this was an app that we developed that people put on their phones that had GPS capability and a survey in it. So when they first put the, the app on their phone, we asked tourists to do a survey. So we knew 
all about themselves and their travel habits. Then um, we asked them to enable the location tracking and we were able to track them through this beautiful state of Tasmania that I'm living in. It was a bit of an experiment. We didn't know how it would go, but over the course of a couple of years, we managed to track around one and a half thousand visitors. And to our complete surprise, it actually worked. People were happy to be tracked if we, we explained why we were doing the research. And for the first time, we were able to continuously track tourists as they move through the entire state of Tasmania. This is a photo of the app that we developed. It had a survey in English and Chinese. Um, and then we were able to develop a dashboard. You can go and have a look at it at www.tourismtracer.com. And um, down the right-hand side, we have filters. So we could look at how different types of people, whether they were from uh, those who entered in different locations through to first and repeat visitors, through to different age groups, we could understand exactly where they they moved uh, around the state of Tasmania. And that gave us some fantastic insights. We were able to understand the eight different types of distinctive itineraries that tourists took through the state. Um, and we had we were able to track them for you know, 21, 28 days, depending on how long they were in the state. We also got some fascinating insights into how uh, people dispersed through the state. So we found that if people came into our capital city, which is called Hobart, you'll see on your right hand side, they didn't tend to disperse far, far. They stayed around Hobart, which is down in the south of the island. But if people came in through different airports up in the north of the state, we found that they tended to disperse farther throughout their actual our island. So we got some really in, good insights into the different reasons why people disperse. We've also done study looking at, studies looking at cruise ship dispersal in Sydney using the Tourism Tracer technology with the Ports Authority of New South Wales. And that allowed us to determine the differences between international tourists, cruise ship tourist dispersal, they are in the map in blue, versus domestic cruise ship tourist dispersal in Sydney. And you can see them in the map in orange and green, and there's some quite stark differences. So Tourism Tracer has given us some really rich insights into how tourists travel through the location. And if you know that, then you can start to understand their impacts. We can also use technology to understand environmental impacts. Using the Tourism Tracer app, we could actually see where people were moving on our bushwalking tracks through our island state of Tasmania. We could see the average time that people walked up to see this lookout here, that was 13 minutes. And then we could understand how they use the track. The track from this lookout down to the beach is actually quite rugged and we thought before the study, before we did the Tourism Tracer study, that not many people actually walked down to the, this beautiful beach called Wineglass Bay. But to our surprise, we discovered that about 47% of our participants actually went down to the beach and then 23% then moved along onto the beach. So there were far more people using this track than we previously realised. So using the data that we collected through Tourism Tracer, um, National Parks then decided to, to shore up and harden up some of the tracks to reduce the amount of trampling on the tracks by tourists into this particular region. We can also use technology to understand their perceptions of tourists and, and how they're feeling about their travel. This uh, is an example, not using Tourism Tracer, but going back to using social media. A couple of years ago, we did a study on the Broken Heel Festival, and that's actually a, a festival uh, where people will actually dress up in drag um, and they actually go into the outback of Australia and have this huge drag queen festival. So um, they dress up in very glamorous costumes and drive into the centre of Australia. So using social media, we will be able to understand people's experiences. So this is a man dressed up as a woman in the middle of the outback. And the interesting thing is, if you think of Australia, you will often think of these images of like big, rugged, 
men with hats on in the outback, you know, wearing very plain T-shirts. They might be farmers um, and they certainly um, they're very it's a very white image, I guess, and, and a heteronormative image. But this festival and we could see it through social media really challenged this perception of the outback of Australia being white and heteronormative and straight. Um, so we we could see through social media people making comments on their experiences and and the impacts of the festival and how the festival had encouraged these outback communities to be more open and accepting of many different types of people. So we can use social media in that way. We can also use social media to understand the well-being benefits of tourists, tourism. So at the moment, we're running a study in Tasmania using the Tourism Tracer app. But rather than just having a plain old survey in the app to understand who people are, we're actually trying, we're asking questions of our tourists about their well-being. And we ask the questions at the beginning of their trip and at the end of their trip. And we also track where they go. And it's giving us a really rich insight into the well-being benefits of tourists and also how different destinations and different regions have more or less of an impact on people's well-being. So, for example, we're looking into whether national parks have more of an impact on well-being than cities. Uh, and that's that data is coming through at the moment. So watch this space and hopefully I'll be able to talk about it at a later date. Some other ways that we can use technology to understand um, sustainable outcomes is whether um, we can actually use it to encourage um, behaviour change. And again, at the moment down at the university, I've got a wonderful PhD student called Martha Wells, and she has actually gamified the Tourism Tracer technology. So what she has done is develop this really fantastic um, game. So tourists can put it on their app uh, on their phone, it's an app and it actually has points of interest where tourists might want to visit in Tasmania, but it actually encourages tourists to go further into the regions. So it, it has little challenges, people can collect points um, and they get rewards and they can actually share their progress with other participants. So the gamification um, research that's been done in, the, in tourism at the moment is particularly exciting because really what it's trying to do is encourage, use different ways to encourage people to travel farther into the regions. Provided regions want tourists, if we encourage them to go there, it means that we're kind of um, reducing the you know, likelihood or the possibility of over-tourism in, in particular areas by dispersing people out. And it's also sharing uh, the benefits of tourism to other regions, not just the big well-known places. So again, that's PhD research that's going on. So um, again, watch this space to see what we find out. The final thing that I'd like to talk about is how we can use technology to understand community perceptions and preferred futures of tourism. For many, many years, we have seen in the in um, in our in our journals and our research books uh, much discussion about community attitudes towards tourism. The thing that worries me about the research that's been done in an attempt to try and achieve sustainability is that there's been a tendency to rely on things like surveys and there's also been a tendency to rely on collecting the attitudes of those who are in power already. So what I've been doing um, with uh, some colleagues of mine, Joseph Cheer, Tamara Young, Regina Scavens, Apa Salome Mavono, is that um, this paper is just about to come out in the next few days, is we've been developing a, a new technique for understanding perceptions of tourism and preferred futures, and it's called citizen social science. And the idea is that we're, we, we're really trying to develop some very cool technology which will allow people who uh, maybe are not particularly literate um, and maybe have not 
pre previously been involved in research um, because they're not highly involved in tourism, but it actually involves those types of people and those in power to try and get a really broad perspective of what people and what residents wants, want in terms of tourism in their region in the future. So you might kind of think, well, how's an app going to do that? But actually what we know is that many people who have low literacy levels still use social media. They use emojis, they use voice technology, they take photos. So what we've done is designed an app, uh, we're, going, we're in the process of doing it, um, that will allow citizens um, to actually work with us and um, create a front end of the app and tell us how they want to collect the data. Tell us what data they think is important for their particular reason, region. Tell us how they would like the data to be actually analysed and also be involved in actually um, distributing the information when we find it. So that's what citizen social science is. So we're using technology to actually apply that particular method I'm really excited about it because I think it really humanises research. We know that many people use technology, but we tend to sort of stick to the same old, same old in-depth interviews and surveys when we do research. So, you know, my challenge to the, the participants in the room is, you know, when you're thinking about doing research and when you're reading um, journal articles, think about who was involved in this research. Did they really tackle the power relationships that exist? Do they understand understand the voices of the heard and also the voices of the unheard and also how can we use really creative methods to collect rich data. So that's what we're trying to do in this particular project and ultimately our goal is to encourage sustainable tourism through doing research that really tackles um, not just the voices of those that are heard and those in power but those who are the voices of those who are unheard. Finally, before I'd like to finish up, I want to say that when we're talking with technology, we are talking about a very brittle beast, particularly when we're talking about social media. And I think this quote is really important. If you're going to be using social media or grabbing um, data that's from, from the internet when you're doing your research, Robert Kozinets wrote that a significant number of people, very likely a majority, would prefer that researchers should not use their social media data and information in their investigations. So I guess a word of caution is that when we're using social media and technology to collect our data, we have to be very, very mindful that not everyone wants their data used um, in studies. We have to be very mindful that the way in which we collect our technological data when we're trying to understand sustainability is really, really ethically sourced and that it aligns with the terms and conditions of the platforms that we're using to collect the data. Facebook, Twitter, Weibo, Snapchat, whatever it might be, TikTok. We always have to be careful um, that the internet, if we're just harvesting data, apps that we might have created ourselves, we always need to do our research when we're using technology in a highly ethical manner. So that bring my, brings my talk to an end. I hope that I've given you a sense of how we can use technology to understand tourist experiences, how they move through locations, how we might be able to use technology to encourage behaviour change, and how we also might be able to use technology to uh, develop a sense of what communities want uh, as their preferred futures if they are destination uh, communities. So thank you very much for joining me and I really look forward to your questions at the end of this session. Thank you, Prof. It was very insightful because as we know, our life is uh, mostly attached with the tourism, uh, sorry, with the social media nowadays. And most of the time, the social media platform is widely used to record our travel and also our memories. And we actually couldn't see the, the story behind it. And there is an alternative way to support the development of the tourism industry and also sustain the pro-environmental behavior. It was a very good insight. And now everyone will think, okay, how my information I can need, the, the, the researchers can using it, or maybe the uh, I uh, even uh, the, the person itself can using it to record and can track and also to enhance the 
pro environmental behavior. I think it will be very good platform as well. Since if you are using the traditional media where you go and talk to the person, advise the person and encourage the person to have the pro environmental behavior at the uh, tourism destination, it may be it's not success 100%, but this is a, a one way where people actually will reflect and participate in more sustainable pro environmental behavior. Thank you again, Prof, for the wonderful sharing. And a gentle reminder again to the dear audience. I'm sure you have a lot of questions in your mind. Please feel free to record all these questions in the Slido links, and definitely we will address them to the respective panel speaker. Okay, so next, I would like to welcome uh, and introduce our third panel speaker, who is not a new face. I, I think some of you already aware that these uh, panel speakers have been as a moderator before. It's not, and um, he's an uh, assistant professor, Dr. Siamak Sefi. Dr. Siamak Sefi, it is an associate professor at Geography Research Unit of the University of Holo, Finland. Using the interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary approach, his research interests focus on the tourism mobility, political consumerism, sustainability, reliance, and as well as the qualitative, sociological, anthropographic research method in tourism. Dr. Siamek has published in leading tourism journal and serves on the editorial board of the multiple tourism journals as well. Now, without delay, let me welcome assist Assistant Professor Dr. Siamek to deliver his speech. Prof. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tana. I'm trying to share my screen here. Okay. I think everything is fine now. Perfect. But thank you very much. And thank you to all our participants uh, for being with us uh, since yesterday for this event and uh, for the engaging session that we had yesterday and, uh, and the session that we have today and tomorrow. Uh, yesterday in the session that I was, um, I was moderating, Professor Noda Scott touched base on a very important uh, topic uh, and timely topic and on the ethical and moral responsibility uh, toward tourism, especially those in the circle of decision making. And he emphasized that. Uh, I start right here. Yeah, but tourism is a complex social phenomenon and different people and different stakeholders participate and influence the practice of tourism. So these are decision maker, as Professor Scott mentioned yesterday, industry organization, uh, uh, governmental agencies, NGOs, and the tourists. And the focus of my talk today is tourists actually. Um, and tourists nowadays play a very significant role in change processes toward a more sustainable development of tourism. And nowadays, consumption plays a significant role in constructing personal identities. And uh, uh, in the UN, in UN Sustainable Development Goal, the SDG called the SDGs, Goal 12, which, 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 which focuses on, on, on responsible consumption productions. And there is increased pressure from consumer and interest groups. There is also a growing, growing public awareness for environmentally responsible practices, responsible consumption, and, and there is expanded media coverage on, on, on environmental and social uh, issues. Uh, political consumerism or political consumptions is a form of uh, uh, civic activism and political engagement, which has become very, very widespread uh, uh, over the last decade with the emergence of, of digital technology, which I'll talk about that later on, uh, means uh, different uh, stance when people evaluate and choose producer and products because they wanna change ethically, environmentally, or politically objectionable institutional market practices. 
uh, and in tourism context, um, the next slide will show the different forms of that. In a more simple way, it means that tourists that actively choose or refuse particular tourism services or destination or, or attraction, let's say, in order to generate social, environmental, or ethical change. And uh, political consumption is, is a new mode of political activities based on individualized responsibility takings. And, and, and the increasing role of political consumption highlights the growing understanding among citizens, especially the, 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 the younger generation uh, of the politics behind products and the complex social and normative context in which a production and day-to-day -day consumption occurs. And political consumerism is a growing features of the global tourism system and the ethics of the tourism. There are four basic of political cons uh, consumerism that have been identified in the literature. So they are boycott, boycott, the scarcity political consumerism in the lifestyle. Maybe the oldest form, which is widely used in tourism, in, in boycott means that refusing to purchase or use a product or services or take part in activity to express your strong dis disapproval of a policy or practices. On the other hand, the boycott, which is the uh, uh, positive way of boycotting, means that you deliberately, tourists deliberately purchase of the products or, 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 or visit the destinations uh, uh, select, uh, based on the their conscious, uh, conscious consumption to demonstrate approval of, 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 of policies or, or, or practices. And the other form is discursive, uh, means that the op opinion formation, especially when there is a concern over human rights violation, which is shaped mainly in social media and, and digital media. And the last form is, is, is lifestyle politics uh, or lifestyle political consumerism is, is your decision, uh, is one decision to use uh, his or her private life to, to inform back, to change established production and consumption practices. Boycott and boycott are widely used, are common uh, forms of political consumerism in tourism that will focus on that. Well, as I just mentioned, uh, political consumption has been very popular in recent years. We can see the in the groups of consumer purchasing, boycotting, or not purchasing, boycotting of products, brand, or services uh, based on different reasons. It can be political or ethical characteristic, the country of place of origin, sustainability, social justice, fair trade, lifestyle, or like veganism, or those sort of things. Um, different actors are involved, individual, civil society groups, the NGOs, uh, are involved. Um, the goals are, 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 diff are diverse, like changing situation, organization, or social condition that are found ethically, environmentally, or po politically desired or objectionable from the perception of boycotters or boycotters. In recent years, there has been a very, uh, very growing use of boycotts. And or growing concern over threats to the environmental quality, climate change, biodiversity laws, unsustainable environmental practices, which all reflected in a very growing number of the boycotts campaign. And, and, and tourism can be commodified and become an arena for political consumerism actions and consumers activism. In, in, in one of the uh, comprehensive studies on, on tourism boycotts, uh, between 19, uh, 1948 and 2015, more than uh, 140, uh, to more precisely, 146 destination boycotts uh, uh, have been occurred, and then more than 90% of them emerging between 23 and 2015. Of course, we cannot really have an accurate assessment of the number of boycotts because it's not easy uh, to find it uh, because of the availability of data and the and the and the changing nature the scope of boycotting practices 
And there are four main reasons for that explain that significant increase in the number of boycotts in tourism. Uh, the first thing is the innovation of new technology, social media platform, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and other social media platforms. The increase in social movement uh, emphasize on ethical consumerism and the use of tourism as a tool for creating social change by tourists. And digital media plays a significant role here because digital media is essential, one way for promoting uh, contemporary tourism businesses and destination, but, that, that, but, the, but on the other side, expose tourism businesses and tourism destinations or service providers to tourists and interest group driving political and social or upstream social markets. And, and digital media, as uh, the previous slide showed, explain one of the main reasons for, for increasing number of boycotts and, and contribute significantly uh, to the constructions uh, of political consumerism because of the internet expansion that has reached a, a, as an everyday means of communications. Uh, because of this expansion and the accessibility of information technologies, it's, it has become much more easier for, for engaged consumers and tourists to express their disapproval, discontent, uh, that, uh, and uh, that which have emerged new forms of online global social movement like cyber activism, interactivism, clicktivism. Consumer activism, or, or, or here tourist digital activism, is, is a sort of activism that performed by tourists uh, through their participating in boycotts, in boycotts, in scarcity uh, political consumerism, uh, is, is an increasingly common form of political actions. Uh, well, as the decline in membership in traditional political activism, like voting, when you vote, for, for example, for presidential election declined, that has led to the emergence of, of consumer activism as the most prevalent way for individuals to participate in politics and have political agency outside of voting. Well, the, the traditional or conventional uh, forms of activism means participating meetings or engaging in protests to gain media coverage, but the internet uh, provided platforms uh, for the groups in a web-based social and political uh, activism and uh, international audience engage in inter interesting issues like environment and human rights concerns. Uh, consumer activism uh, fundamentally is about creating a desired change or halting desired change related to the consumption issues. And the emergence of new digital media and social media, and particularly the social media, increase our connectivity, which has become crucial for tourism businesses. And digital media technology are both information source and, and mediators of, of consumer ethical activism. Uh, in, in one of our papers, which, uh, which uh, recently published in Journal of Sustainable Tourism uh, and, and, and out uh, and published online just only, uh, I think it was last week, uh, we've examined how digital media engagement uh, influence the constructions and mobilization of, of political consumerism among Gen Z, Generation Z, those, uh, of course, there is no single definition of this, uh, of this, uh, of this court of traveler, but uh, it refers to those uh, between, uh, uh, were born between mid 90 to 20, 2010, between, let's say till 25 or 25 uh, uh, five years old. And in our study, uh, the, uh, uh, the finding of our study showed that the digital information source play a crucial role in the initial political consumption decisions. The internet 
and social media provide consumers with, 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 with recent information. They know about the boycotts campaign or the boycotts campaign and their exposure to the news media that, that shared on social media positively influence, works as a stimulate, influence their, 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 their political participatory behavior. And uh, through the awareness that occurred through the uh, social media engagement and the communication capabilities of social media uh, allow individual to express their political opinion and engagement in the political discussion with, with their online peers. And the other important thing here is the digitally driven networks is, a, is that political consumerism means that boycotting or boycotting has a network character. So what does it mean? So it means that online communities are created based on common identities and interest. And that uh, common identity and interest facilitate the creation and joining of, of civic and, and political groups. And the result of that is, is the formation of, of collective identity and the rapid scale up of the political actions. And that formation of awareness because of the exposure to the digital media uh, information and social ties in the online communities result in a varying degree, which here is the spectrum of digital uh, political uh, consumerism that's shaped in a digital environment, cyber environment. Um, and here uh, we've identified three different degree of, 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 of digital political consumerism, starting from the spectator activities to transitional through transitional to digital gladiatorial activities. In each, in each degree, in each category, there are different actions. Uh, for example, for spectators, is, uh, for, uh, let me give you an example. For example, you uh, see a boycott campaign on, on, on social media, on your Instagram, and then you like it or you share it or you repost it, that, or, or you comment on that. You say that, yeah, it's okay. I will participate at that. I will share that. But that's a very passive online behavior that shapes a very passive online behavior here. Um, but on the other side, we have these transitional activities that, that participate in different sort of workshop, you, uh, in membership rooms, organization, and, and, and influencing the influencers or the celebrities by sending some videos to them and, and, uh, and seeking their endorsement to have a wider audience for that. And that shapes uh, opposite social marketing elements. And, and, and the last form here is digital gladiatorial activities, which is creating content organizing a campaign or develop, uh, developing e-petitions or for boycottings, uh, which means that it, it is direct actions to effective systematic change. So that shows uh, different three forms of digital activism behavior shaped in digital in environment ranging from a passive behavior to a very active and direct action to affect uh, systematic change. Uh, well, that brings me to the end of my presentation. I hope that uh, this very brief presentation uh, will be useful to understanding that tourism can be used as a way for creating the positive change as a, and boycotts can be used uh, for, uh, for social justice and, 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 and tourism consumption behavior and purchasing behavior can be used as a, as a tool to make pressure on, on tourism businesses, on tourism destination, which 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 are perceived from uh, from the tourist perception that they they are morally, ethically, or environmentally, or or for human rights violation for different reasons, uh, they uh, they are objectionable. Or of course, if a destination or tourism service provider or or or, or, or for example, tour operator, they they respect. Uh, the environment, for example, for sustainability. So we purchase from them through our, 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 our boycottings. 
thank you very much for your attention and uh, I will be very pleased to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Siamak. I think it was a very interesting also. We want to see the younger generation who born with the technology can using the technology to actually come out with the concept of political consumerism. So it's actually um, maybe some, some uh, terms is have been used in the people life, but we didn't understand or maybe some of them not aware the story behind it, how it is very powerful to enhance the sustainable tourism behavior among the younger generation. I think uh, the three panel speakers already giving a very good insight, especially how to build, how to enhance the uh, pro-environmental behavior because this pro-environmental behavior is something not like uh, you just go and encourage them to do it. It must be come from the person itself, where the person is a uh, loves the nature, conserves the nature. It's not, not only the nature, it's, it can be anything. And it's can it's need to be sustained for longer because we always believe that we borrow the resources from the future generation, not we are taking from the previous generation. So when we are borrowing from the future generation, it's our duty, if it's our responsibility to giving it back to them in a proper manner. I think it, the pro-environmental concept that you are highlighting just now, it is a very good concept and point that everyone must take and apply in their life. Okay, so without further ado, yeah, definitely it, uh, it's giving very good insight to our audience as well because there is a few questions from them as well. Okay, I will start the first question from uh, Prof. Dr. Xavier. Uh, Prof, this question is addressing to you. Do you think the green social media influencer could be by what the sustainable tourism marketing and how to prevent greenwashing in marketing? Prof. Xavier? Professor Dr. Devi, can you hear me? I can, yes. Ah, yes, Prof. This question is addressed to you. Okay, repeat again the question. Do you think green social media influencer could be by water in sustainable tourism marketing and how to prevent green washing in marketing? Yeah, good question. Yes, yes obviously. Um, look, everybody plays a part, but we need to remember that. We, um, we will try to change the behavior of consumers by providing them things that they want or by shaming them into not doing things that are socially unacceptable. So uh, anybody who's been a parent knows that using a stick or a carrot, well, actually carrots tend to work an awful lot better than sticks. And I think when we are grown ups, we're not really that different to when we were children. So we, we can shame people into you know saying to them, you shouldn't do certain things. We've seen this with flight shaming and so on. But also, I think the majority of consumers respond a lot better to what um, you know Anne was um, saying. You know earlier on. You know, like if we nudge them towards giving them interesting alternatives of things to do in places that may be less known, but that make people excited about trying something different, we may increase the ability of diversifying demand and getting them to, you know, kind of um, go to places where we want them to go and to avoid bottlenecks. Um, from a greenwashing point of view, yes, it is a problem. But frankly, I think a lot of companies don't greenwash because they want to lie to consumers. They may greenwash because they don't necessarily know how to do it better. So I'm more interested in finding ways in which we can help those companies do it better than to do a public shaming for having greenwashed, particularly with small firms. I have a lot less patience with large firms that greenwash. Thank you, Prof for addressing the question. I have another question also, Prof. Um, since you're actually highlighting the booking.com is actually the commercialized retail uh, travel company who actually taking the initiative to support the pro-environmental behavior. May, uh, can we know how is the response from the other travel uh, retail company? Are they welcoming this idea? And how is the response from the tourists when they realize that the, the, the prices, there will be a changes in the prices, although they realize that 
it will be contribute to the green environment and so on. So how is the response from the competitor or partner? At the same time, how is the response from the uh, consumer as well? I mean, look, the competitors are responding in a variety of ways. If you're a large company, you are paying attention. That's why Google and Expedia decided to join the partnership our way through because they said this is working. And if you are one of the large players, you need to be part of this. OK, so we expect there will be other companies, um, you know, that are also heavyweight that will also join the partnership. Um, and in terms of how the consumers are responding um, cautiously, and, and I think the key here is to not try to make a big splash, because if you try to make a big splash, you overpromise, and then you'll find yourself under delivering. So nudging gently probably has a better chance of creating change. You know, if, if you make those green logos too big, consumers end up thinking the products are something too different to what they would normally consume and they end up avoiding them. So presenting more sustainable products with a degree of normality makes them much more acceptable to the consumer. Exactly. Thank you, Prof. I, I totally agree that, um, that, that the concept that you're highlighting is uh, don't overpromise because now is a technology is making all the information at their fingertips that everyone is knowledgeable, everyone is concerning about that. But when um, any uh, travel company or any travel suppliers taking the initiative, they must think how to sustaining it because the consumers always will be there to support. Although the, the response will be lower, but later on it will be increased because they want to. But if let's say there is any barriers and there is, will be any issue, it will revert back to them uh, they will go back to the zero again and they will start to think negatively and it will become a barrier. I think that the both parties must work together. Am I correct, Prof? Yeah, yeah, you're right. And uh, look, the, the questions you're asking me link to some of the things that the other speakers have spoken about. So CMAX research on boycotting, you know, uh, is, is really interesting because you will, you will find yourself that if you overpromise, particularly if you're a large company, you can get some, some backlash. So in that, in that sense, some of my research in the past um, found that companies tend to underplay their sustainability practices because they don't necessarily see that consumers will deliberately want to buy a product for being green. So I, I came up with a concept of green hushing some years ago to explain why companies that were actually doing a lot of really good things for sustainability were deliberately not communicating about 70% of their sustainability practices because they basically say, well, I don't think the customers really care. So, so this is why we need to become much more clever, uh, you know, to create that change. But also what I'd say is anybody who is a, an academic listening today, stop doing questionnaires, asking consumers whether you care about the environment. This is so, this, we used to this 10 years ago, 15 years ago, please ditch the theory of planned behavior you know, to explain whether there is pro, you know, pro, you know, pro environmental behavioral intentions, you will not get it published. And, and it doesn't tell us anything anymore, right? You know, to do experimental research if you can, where you actually engage with a company to try to create some change and you have some A-B testing to see whether the changes of interviews actually create any change in consumer behavior. Because then yeah. we have something that's much more applied and your research will have much more impact Exactly, exactly, Prof. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof, for your answers. Okay, now I'm moving to Prof Annie. Prof Annie, there is a question from uh, Esotopia where um, this, student, this person from Esotopia, he say she, they have a best ecotourism eco site which has been selected in 2022 uh, GC, 1C ecotourism site of Esotopia. But Still, we would not use any technology which supports sustainability of the destination. How can you support and work with us to use different technology since our country is developing country uh, which is not benefited from the tourism industry? Thank you. Um, it's a good question. Uh, the use of technology in developing countries is something that we are um, playing with at the moment. Um, we're hoping to apply our citizen social science technology in Fiji 
and there are a variety of different ways that you can actually use technology in destinations what a, where connectivity is not as high as other destinations. So, for example, you can actually um, design apps that don't necessarily need uh, connectivity to collect data. So they can collect GPS data even when there's no reception because they talk to satellites that don't, you don't need to actually have Wi-Fi or, or mobile reception and they actually store the coordinates and send it back when you're, you're in range. So there's a, a range of which different ways that you can actually use technology in regions with low connectivity. Um, and yeah, absolutely, if that person wanted to reach out, I'd, I'd be happy to chat to them in, in more detail. But the other thing that you can actually do is look, use technology to understand what uh, tourists who are about to visit the destination might be thinking about it. Um, you can use technology to understand uh, people's experiences once they've been to, to different places. Um, but yeah, the, the important thing, I guess, is that when you're um, designing technology as a tool through which you might collect a data, your data, it's really important to be very, very aware of the, the context within which you're using um, the connectivity, whether you've got 3G, 4G or 5G, um, and also the language and power barriers that might exist in the communities that you're collecting your data within. Okay, thank you, Prof. I hope uh, that the answer is will be beneficial to the person who asked the question. Prof, um, the, the tourism tracker and mobility concept that you are initiating is actually uh, will be a good insight to the tourism academician as well, because we always engaged our students with the varieties and sustainability project. I think it will be good that we, are, we also can get this idea and testing it, especially in a various country. As a case study, then we can share that input to you and definitely we will contact you during um, this project as well and uh, uh, in in line of thinking on this I, I'm actually uh, it's crossed in my mind that about the privacy because when we are talking about the social media and also the tracking system everyone is concerned about their personal data and privacy so how do you handle this situation especially in a tourism tracker also you get their concern uh, how data you you will be using it and how it actually will help you? Yeah, sure. It's a good question. So with Tourism Tracer, we it's an it's an app, and uh, when people uh, consent to use it, we have a range of screens right at the front that they they swipe through, which explains how the app works. So because the app was developed by the University of Tasmania, we explain that if people want to take part in the study, their their data is only going to be used by the University of Tasmania for the purposes of tourism research. So we actually have probably less privacy concerns with Tourism Tracer than we do when we're actually scraping data from, from Instagram and Facebook. Because with, with Tourism Tracer, a lot of the recruitment we did was face-to-face. -face. So if I was recruiting someone, I could say, I, you know, I, I could look at them, realise that they're a person, um, be sort of aware of their age, that type of thing. So, um, you know, provided we respect the data, which we have to because of the ethics regulations that our university has to abide by, then their privacy is respected. We don't um, collect data or we, we delete the data if we see where they're staying because we can see them coming and going from a hotel. We don't collect names or identifying information. But when you're getting technology, using technology to get data from things like social media, such as Instagram or Facebook, for example, you can't always be sure that that person who has their profile page is actually that person. You can't always be sure that they're an adult or, or a child because you don't already always know um, their date of birth. And you can't always be sure with things like Twitter, whether they're even a tourist or a resident. So um, I think, you know, that's what I was mentioning also in regards 
relates to ethics that when mm. you're using technology, you really need to be very, very aware of how you're using the data and being sure that you don't reveal anything, particularly with sensitive data, such as the stuff we did with um, the, the drag queens, that you don't ever ident and, uh, reveal the identity of the person um, and that whether it's through a photograph that you might use or, um, or text. And in fact, in the case of our drag queen festival, we contacted all the people whose photographs we used and asked if it would be okay. So I think, you know, big data and data scraping when you're doing that, um, you need to be really very, very careful that you're doing it ethically and, and um, you know, respecting the privacy of individuals. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Prof, for the tips. Okay, definitely we will take into the consideration the ethical when we mm. actually doing this uh, tourism tracker project. Thank you, mm. Prof. Okay, our last, yeah. Uh, another question, and it should be the last question to Dr. Siamek. Dr. Siamek, I think your, your topic is very interesting because it will be the eye opener to younger generation, how they actually can uh, raise up their issue and also can protect or can be um, activism in a different way. You're using the term activism, right? So when you promote this concept, when you actually come up with this idea, what are the challenges that you are facing? Is it everyone welcoming this idea, consumer, uh, the political consumerism or consumer activism? Is it everyone welcoming the idea? If you encounter any challenges, can you share it to us? Well, thank you very much uh, for this uh, great and interesting questions. Well, well, it depends actually. Uh, my, my recent research focuses on the Gen Z, the generation Z, because this, this generation, according to many studies and our studies, uh, they are different in, in a number of ways uh, comparing to the previous generation when it comes to the ethical consumption and political consumptions. Uh, and that, that there is also evidence for that is based on the number of boycotts and boycotts alongside different generation, for example, our parents' generation, generation X, millennials, uh, generation baby boomers, generation X, millennials, and the Gen Z. Well, one of the main things here is about the target of boycotts, especially for human rights violation, which is a very sensitive issue nowadays, especially, for example, on social media, we've seen a number of uh, campaigns, boycott campaigns uh, for, for human rights violation. For example, the Myanmar, you know, if mm. I want to give an example, or for example, Turkey, because of the of violation against the Kurdish minority, those sort of things. So that's uh, the sensitivity of the, of, the, of, the, of the boycott campaign is one issue here. Uh, and the other things, uh, for example, in, in one of our studies, uh, we asked the... Uh, Gen Z, Gen Z groups, about the, their participation in boycotts, and it was about the pro-sustainability in the general terms. And uh, when the target of the boycotts is the big, big, uh, let's say businesses, like the chain hotels, so, and also if it's a small hotel. So there is, there is no straightforward and easy answer to these questions. For example, uh, let, let me give the example of a, uh, of, of a destination. One view says that at all costs, we shouldn't go and avoid uh, traveling to the destination, destination to show our disapproval and discontent with the re regime ruling that destinations. So there's one view on that. And the other view says that, no, it doesn't work because there are many, many people working in tourism industry, especially in, in a very, uh, like in hotels, like in... Uh, uh, like as a tour guide, and traveling to such a destination helps to uh, uh, bring the population out of isolations, and uh, and their income is is largely dependent on highly dependent on tourism. So there is there is really really no easy answer to this question that really really depends on the target of the boycott, of the reason of the boycott, and who boycotts the destinations. So that's about the. Uh, uh, this the, the challenges that 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 many boycotters face when it comes to participating and engaging in boycottings. I, I hope I understood the question. Yes, yes, Prof. I, I totally understand the challenges. It's not easy, and uh, maybe the the the, the ideas and the, the way we are handling will be different as well. 
thank you so much, Rob. Oh, sorry, we want to wrap up the session because uh, it's already 5.25. So thank you again for further clarification, dear panel speakers. And I'm sure the audience are gaining some new insight about the innovation and technology in tourism and its role in enhancing the pro-environmental behavior among the tourists through these three different panel speakers. And I uh, just want to wrap up what is uh, shared by uh, Professor Dr. Xavier, where he actually highlight about the how the tour operators and tour, uh, travel retail companies and also uh, travel support companies actually start, start initiating the various sustainable practices and it's actually indirectly promoting the pro-environmental behavior among the consumers. So they're already initiating the efforts, so it will be supported by the consumers as well. And meanwhile, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Annie is uh, highlighted on the usage of the technology such as the tracking system through the social media, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, to promote the sustainable and uh, pro-environmental behavior and practices among the tourists. And finally, Assistant Professor Dr. Siamek Seifi is a highlight on the concept of the political consumerism or consumer activism as a pathway to achieve sustainable tourism by using the digital technology among the Generation Z who are often portrayed as a socially and environmentally conscious tourist. So thank you again to our panel speaker and audience for your valuable time. I know it's uh, 5.30, so it's a very valuable time. Thanks again to joining with us. And 